And hello, everyone, and welcome back to Cyrus Webb Presents here on Amazon Live. I'm your host, Cyrus Webb. Glad you all could join us once again. Before we get started, I want to say thank you all so much for your support of Amazon Live and our program here, Cyrus Webb Presents. Thanks to you, we begin 2024 as the number one media show here on Amazon. And this is all because of your support. So I really do appreciate you guys. If you're new to us on the Amazon Live side, welcome. Make sure you guys do hit that follow button. You see it either here in this corner or down below. You will also see some of the books from our next guest. I'm so excited to be beginning a brand new series with my friend, Dr. Bama Bagby. She's the author of the best-selling Catch series. You all can see the books behind her. The very first book is here, The Catch No One Wants. You guys can see it there. And then, of course, there is The Wrong Catch. Mm -hmm. And I've been showing you guys the newest book, The Wrong Catch. She'll tear down the house on my Kindle. But, Dr. Velma, bam, oh! I got my paperback <laughs> in today. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so I have my paperback. I love my paperback. I had the Kindle edition. Uh, but I was so glad to get my paper back in the mail. You can get all three of them here on Amazon. We're going to talk to Dr. Velma briefly about the success of the series. But also, of course, we're going to be drilling down on how it all began, really taking you guys into how it all started with this book, The Catch No One Wants. Hello to you, Ellen Sutters. Good to be able to see you over there on the Facebook site. Also, we have Miss Queenie joining us as well. Enjoy the two of you together talking about the color purple. I saw you guys on your program uh, on IG. So congratulations to the two of you. But Dr. Velma, welcome back to the broadcast. Thank you, Cyrus. I'm glad to be back. I'm looking forward to your questions because I know you come prepared. <laughs> well, look, it is always a pleasure. I was just so excited. I, I didn't want to tell you it was supposed to come in today because our mail here, you never know if no. it's going to come before our show, after the show, but it actually came a couple of hours ago. So wow. I was so excited <laughs> when wow. I, I was able to be able to get it. So I want to talk about being able to sit with this. You have more than these three books. I want our audience to know that. But what has it been like for you, Dr. Belma, to see the impact that these three books are having when it comes to readers? I'm so excited because there's a lot of effort that goes into writing and, and weaving stories in the way that I had to weave the stories. But to, to hear the feedback that I've been getting, it, it's so encouraging to me. It kind mm -hmm. of validates that the road that I took beginning with that first book, the Black book, was the right road for me. And the mm -hmm. genre that I settled in was the right genre for me. So I'm excited. Yeah. And to that point, for those who don't know you, Dr. Velma, Dr. Velma has written nonfiction work before. You all can find those books here on Amazon. So definitely take advantage of that. Did you find it to be more challenging to write fiction, uh, Dr. Velma? Or was it something that you, you were excited to try? No, I found it was exciting because it gives you room to be creative because it's fiction. Okay. You know, even though there's always elements of truth in the stories, yet mm -hmm. it's fictional in the sense that it's make believe. All of the things that I created in there, it's pretty much made up things based mm -hmm. on research. You know, sometimes I incorporated things that I researched, what I wanted to know about the particular characters, issues, all of that. Um, but I think it's more uh, fun because you get to design and create the person as you go along, it, it evolves. I don't have an idea of what that person's gonna look like at the beginning of my writing. It evolves as I write. Yeah, I love that. And and I think that's what we've been able to see from you as well. And Dr. Velma, I wanna dive right into the Catch No One Wants, which is the first book, of course, as I mentioned, that started it all. And you and I have talked about the main characters before, that being Grayson, the father, Veronica, the daughter. I wanted to talk about some things we had not talked about. You know, I love to do that. Yeah. Uh, because, I, <laughs> because for one, it's interesting to me, and I think it'll be interesting for our audience. But I think, two, we're able to see some commonality between things that you have heard Things yeah. that you've experienced that you're able to share uh, with the audience as well. I want to say hello to Myra. Myra's joining us over on Facebook. Hi. Myra, hello to you. Glad you all, you could be able to join us as well. And then those tuning in on the Amazon side, appreciate you guys and appreciate the hearts as well. Thank you guys for being with us there. We are simulcasting this, I should mention, to not only Facebook, but also LinkedIn, YouTube, and Twitter or X. So make sure you guys, if you have any questions or comments for Dr. Velma as we're going through Put those in the chat. We'll be glad to be able to bring those up. But I want to uh, focus a little bit on one of my favorite chapters. And I never told you about this. Dr. <laughs> okay. chapter, chapter four of the book. Oh. And, it is, and it's interesting because that's when you talk about the catfish. Now, 
I have to be honest with you guys. Most of you know I'm a southerner. And catfish is my favorite fish, Doctor. <laughs> that, that's my that's what I'm having treating my treating myself to this weekend. I'll tell you I was treating the family yeah. dinner. We're yeah. gonna be having beef, but I love my catfish. But there are some interesting things that you say, and we we want to dive into this chapter. But I want to talk about how you made the decision about describing the men as fish. For those who are new to the series, explain yeah. them how you did that in the first book. Well, I got the idea from Jesus, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. in his parables, he used a variety of things to, you know, weave his stories around them. However, mm -hmm. the fish sometimes somehow gravitated towards me, the idea of using them, because mm -hmm. I have ex I've grown up with expert fishermen in my life. My father mm -hmm. was an expert, then my oldest brother became an expert as well. So just having that conversation with him when I had the idea of using them to describe the men. Um, had the conversation with him in terms of what he thought was his favorite. That's all I asked. What are your favorite fish? Tell me how do you get them? What bait do you use? And the details he gave me just, it was so easy to do. It was so yeah. easy to put a face on and a character attached to that catfish because I've seen that kind of person before. I didn't date him, but I've seen him. And so yeah. it was important for me to uh, to use that. And as a result, uh, many of the readers have asked for more fish analogies because they related to the men they met along the way in their lives and could see mm -hmm. these same characteristics in those men. Yeah. And that's why I chose this chapter. One, of course, my love of catfish personally, but also because Me too. I love the way you're able to connect the two things. So let's let's go ahead and get into that. So if you do not have your copy of The Catch No One Wants, now's the opportunity to take advantage of getting it for yourself. You can get the paperback here on Amazon and you can get the Kindle edition. I'm going to highlight it for you guys over on Amazon for only 99 cents. In fact, Right now, you can get, let me double check before I put my foot in my mouth. You can get all of the Kindle editions for 99 cents right now in the series. So go ahead and one click it, dive into this. But this is what Dr. Bama writes about in chapter four, where Grayson, who's the father, is talking to his daughter, Veronica, about these different type of fish and catfish is what's up next. You say this in um, page 51 of the book as he's talking, Dr. Bama, catfish weren't interested in bait during this time. And for this reason, they are called lazy fish. They aren't attracted to bait on a fishing line. Catfish enjoy sitting on the bottom floor of a lake, which is where the name bottom feeders comes from. Bottom feeders enjoy sitting near where the trash, garbage, dead things, and debris settle. Because they sit at the bottom of the lake, fishers also call them scavenger fish because they dig in the trash for food. Catfish feed on rotten fish, dead animals, and sewage, which is why they're also called garbage fish. Their love for smelly bait explains why they're considered unclean. And I love that you go on to say this when it comes to when he's making the, the connection to men, Dr. Bell, I'm on page 53. Uh-huh. Because he's talking about to Veronica uh, about Valerie. Uh, right. and, and, and one of the things he says is she did not want to be paraded around for three to five years on the man's arm. She mm -hmm. wanted a commitment that was stronger than that. Valerie wanted marriage. And then this is what Grayson says, a guy, if honest, will admit that he knew the moment he met the woman, he would marry her. He won't express it right away. He should spend the time examining her as the right fit. And you should do do with as you should do with a guy. I want to talk about that because if you all have been listening to my conversations. Yeah. Dr. Velma has talked about about in her own life. Mm -hmm. uh, about these things when it comes to, to, to men. What was it like for you to teach that lesson, Dr. Bama, uh, to, to Veronica through Grayson about what she, not only should she be wanting in a man, but what a man should be wanting in her? And understanding the, the process, because a, mm -hmm. a lot of conversation has taken place around women being too forceful and mm -hmm. pushy when we know that the word says uh, the man findeth the wife when a man finds a wife he finds a good thing and so it was important for her to understand these principles from her father because she had gotten into a habit of taking the wrong approach and she was trying to rush through men to try to find someone to marry so i thought it was an important point to make right there 
Yeah. I showed the new book, uh, Dr. Bama, because Angela says, I'm loving the blue cover. She's talking about the one. <laughs> so I wanted to show it so she can see I have mine too. Hello <laughs> to you, Wendy. Good to be able to see you as well. Thank you for joining us on the Facebook side as well. And that is the, the great thing. And I love the, the connection. So I, I think this goes to a bigger point, Dr. Bama, when it comes to this book, because yes, this is fiction, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. But as you and I have talked about before, it, it is also the truth. Yes. You know, so talk to us about what that conversation has been like for people enjoying the stories you're telling, but the real conversations they're starting to have with themselves about these characters. Oh, it's very real because uh, I gave an example. I, I'm not sure if you and I talked about it, of a, a rep receptionist at my doctor's office who uh, mm -hmm. shared with me. She read the book, really loved it, shared with me a situation with a friend who was in a toxic relationship. And I said, why don't you give her the book? I said, ask her to read the story of the puffer fish so that that might help her. And sure, as a result, she gave it, gave her the book. And even though the friends had been talking to her for a long time, trying to convince her to get out of that relationship, it was after she read the story of the puffer fish and could yeah. see herself in that story, did she get out of that relationship? So to me, uh, Cyrus, that's real. There's truth in there, yes, but weaving the stories allows that person to discover what they need to discover themselves. And so it's not forceful, it's, it's entertaining, but at the same time, it's educational as well. Yeah, and, and hello to you, Latonya. Good to be able to see you. She's joining us on the... Um, on the Facebook side, she says hello. Uh, and Miss Queenie says she has hers too. So, so <laughs> is uh, that the new book? <laughs> yeah, the new. And Ellen says blue of any kind is my favorite color. Although oh. I'm a May baby, supposed to be emerald. I love blue too, um, oh. Ellen. So you can't have blue. Stick stick with emerald. Stick with emerald unless you. Well, blue <laughs> was my mom's favorite color. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, uh, Wendy says they will definitely see themselves. I uh, appreciate you all being with us. Again, if you have any questions or comments for Dr. Velma and myself, make sure you guys put those in the comments. And that's why, again, this book, I think, was a great start to this series because we're able to see a real evolution of Veronica. But I want to also say, Dr. Velma, even though Grayson is the one taking the lead, mm -hmm. we see a real evolution in Grayson, too. Yeah. And in his realizing he's not just a father. Right. He's someone who's genuinely trying to help, you yeah. know, someone. Uh, it just happens to be his daughter, of yeah. course. Um, yeah. Talk to us about that balance, because it's not always easy for parents to have these kind of conversations, especially in 2023. It's not very easy for parents to have them. And it's not very easy for children to listen. So what was that like for you to show that dynamic? Because I had that experience when I wrote that first book, that was my uh, 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 that was my capturing the conversations I had with my adult daughters about men. We decided to do this deep dive and agreed to be honest and with each other. And I had to agree to hear some things I did not know about that probably would not have settled very well had I heard it before that experience, mm -hmm. but we made that agreement to just be honest and open. And so when we had that conversation, it reminded me of that moment with my own daughters where I had to mm, grit my teeth when I heard something I really did not like, but I had to hear it um, in order for us to move those conversations forward. And so I saw that in Grayson's opportunity to show some grace to his own daughters uh, so that how else can they learn? How else can they know if you shut down because you heard something you didn't want to hear? Yeah. That's showing grace to even your kids. Uh, even when I had the conversations with my daughters, I had to show grace because we were at a point where I could help them move forward or I could shut down because of what I just hit, what I just heard. And I chose yeah. to listen and, and be engaged with them. Yeah. So uh, that leads us to another thing you and I've never talked about, uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Velma, and that is the letter in the book. <laughs> you um, didn't. Yeah, yeah. We, 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 we've never we've never talked about the letter. I want to talk about the letter because that's the reason why I kind of teed up that question. Because yeah, again, some of these things are hard conversations to have, yeah. right? And yeah. yeah, we may laugh about it as we're doing with the book. You know, we may, right. but these are real situations, real. right? Yeah, real. Um, and so talk about, before I read what I want to read from the letter, how did you come to the decision for Grayson to write a letter to his daughter? 
I just wanted that to be a moment. I just wanted people to see that moment that a father had to make sure he was encouraging and assuring, assuring his daughter that she she may have gotten it wrong for a minute, but he was mm -hmm. there for her to ensure that she worked her way out of it and can find her way to what she needed because he had two other kids. They yeah. were already married and he's a pastor of a church where he's teaching singles ministry. So she's gone through that too. So she's aware of what her father knows, but it was him showing grace and love towards his daughter, which is what we receive from our, through our faith from God. And so it was important to show that it's possible for us to do that. We just have to put our feelings aside and, and do what ne what's necessary. Exactly. So let's get into it. It's in chapter eight of the book. Uh, the Catch No One Wants, for those who are just coming in, welcome to you guys. You all are watching Cyrus Represents here on Amazon Live, but we are simulcasting on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter. We're talking to best-selling author Dr. Velma Bagby today about her Catch series. I have all of my books right here, but we're focusing on uh, The Catch No One Wants today, and, and this is part of a series that we're doing here on Amazon Live. We're going to be going book by book. This week, it is the first book. Next yep. week, if you guys join us, we'll be talking about The Wrong Catch. And then after that, the newest book, The Wrong Catch, she'll start in the house. And then we'll be wrapping it up, bringing you guys into the conversation, talking about the whole series. So we'll be inviting your questions and comments as well. But in Chapter 8, this is the part of the letter that really got me. Okay. Because it... it it was a it was a father talking to his daughter, but it also to me could have been you know an older brother talking to his yeah. sister, yeah. Um, you know, or someone who's kind of been seeing someone kind of you know may have been losing their way. This is what what Grayson says, and they're called to be your protector. I will help you with this process using a loving approach. I want to come back to that. I love you more than you know, and it will bring me joy to see you and your husband walk down the aisle with my blessing. I am in this with you, my daughter, and I promise to help you fall in love the way God intends. Yeah. That is a part of the letter to me that is so interesting because for one, it's Grayson acknowledging what he has to do, mm -hmm. have that loving approach and not be critical as some yeah. parents are yeah. accused of being, uh, judgmental as some parents are accused of being because you know they have their thoughts. Talk to us about why that was important for you to make sure that Grayson let her know that he was going to be in this with her, um, but and also be that person she could count on. Because I wanted it to be presented there because it doesn't matter where you're struggling at in your journey. There is always someone in your life, whether it's a father or someone else who cares deeply about you, uh, that can keep you encouraged and inspire you despite whatever shortcomings you had to experience, uh, downfall falls that you had. And I thought that piece was so important because we all have them. I, I had to have somebody to encourage me in a moment of my life where it was not going very well. So it's good to have somebody that can do that, whether it's your father, someone, a relative, but someone in your life that can do that for you and, and not be judgmental. Just like he said, he assured her several times that he loved her. He said it several times that he would be there for her, which means you can you can't do too. You can't mess up too badly that I won't be there for you. But isn't that what we get in our faith that we can't go too far down in the depths? of despair that yeah. God is not able to reach and get us and still love us. And so mm -hmm. we get that every day. Yeah. Wendy says her father was very calm and it took his and took his time explaining the different scenarios. Very true. And but I do love the fact that he did have to catch himself along the way too to make yeah. sure that he was doing it the right way. Um Dr. Velma, I want to talk to you about something that's personal. <laughs> That we have not discussed. I can tell that expression. <laughs> on that look. Where are look, you going? <laughs> look, my, my mom says when I do this work, she says, she says, I remind her of my father. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh -oh. so okay, sit up straight. You, okay, so I want you to share with our, our audience, for those who don't know, it's going to tie in. I'm not even going to tell you what to say, but I want them to, to, you to share with them your experience with in your husband what you were thinking of and, and you know, who you were able to find. And then I'll go into the last part I want to talk about. <laughs> what was I thinking of in terms of right. my husband, you said? Yeah, yeah, about, about who you wanted to marry and who you were expecting to, uh, to, to marry. Oh, are you talking about my list? Yes. <laughs> I, 
I was 16 in 10th grade when our Bible study teacher told us to create a husband to be prayer list. And I talk mm -hmm. about that a lot now too, because I had to learn some things about that list. I didn't know at 16, mm -hmm. but when I wrote this list at the time in the San Francisco Bay area, our high school basketball team was number one in the area. Hoo -hoo, and most of them had bold legs. So of yeah. course I put on my list, God, please send me a man with bold legs. I asked for a certain height. I think I said six, six, two, six, oh, something like that. Mm -hmm. And those, that was on the top of my list along with other things I wanted to have. But yeah. God has a sense of humor, especially when you asked him to help you discover that person. Because I joke about the fact that many times at church now, because my husband is a pastor, I would hold when we're in a prayer circle and I'm holding my husband's hand. I look down occasionally because I have a little chuckle with God again going, God, you're so funny. You have a sense of humor. I'm looking down at my husband's feet. No bald legs down there, just slewed feet. Mm -hmm. I said, but you knew who I needed and I'm grateful for it. So that's the joke about the husband to be prayer list. I, yeah. It was a 16 year old's <laughs> list. Yeah. And the reason this is another part of the book you and I have not discussed before. Uh, Ellen says, not Dr. Velva having a list because this is what Veronica realized. And I thought about that when I was prepping for the segment about this book. Yeah. When she is speaking to the congregation, this is what uh, Veronica says to them. It turns out his physical height didn't matter because uh -huh. the man I married gets taller and taller every day, not physically, but in his character, respect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. love and care and concern for me. He -hmm. grows taller from the way he treats me as his wife. So I wanted oh, to yeah. ask you, Dr. Velma, what do you want our audience to remember about that? Because there is the idea that men and women have about yeah. what they want, but how sometimes they get not only what they need, but also get it in ways they may not have expected. Because you have to be careful what you put on that list. I was 16. You should not be in your 40s and 50s trying to make a list telling God I want him to have bold legs. That's ridiculous. And yeah. that's the reason I get into details about the list, mm -hmm. about not focusing on conditions. Because mm -hmm. the legs can be bold today and wobbled, wobbly later on. You don't know. So yeah. I, you have to be very careful that you not focus on conditions. Because mm -hmm. that description really describes my husband. Someone who was very quiet, someone who was very not forceful, but took his time. He, he took about two, two years before he really wanted to uh, make an effort to court me. Because even though he wrote in my yearbook on the last day of school, graduation day, to the, to the woman who would be my wife one day. So he knew who he wanted. He mm -hmm. wasn't ready for me yet. And mm -hmm. so what would have happened if I forced him and made him? Okay, you're saying this in my book. Let's get, let's start <laughs> dating. We're not dating anymore. But this is what women do now. They get so aggressive and pushy. Mm -hmm. I let it go because, again, I had, I had goals too. And, again, I encourage women to focus on their goals as well. You wouldn't be so worried about when he's going to arrive if you were busy doing what you should be doing at that time. My husband mm -hmm. showed up two years later. And began courting me and we uh, were able to get engaged that following year on my birthday what i did not know is at the time he went to my mother my mother was a very strong woman you didn't mess with albina mm -hmm. <laughs> but she was a country girl from ville platte louisiana mm -hmm. and she did not play and all of us we respected her highly because of that but he did go to her and I wasn't aware of it at the time and asked her for my hand in marriage, which I thought was the most honorable thing I could have heard of at that time. Now that's 71, I think it was at the time. Wow. So I thought that was important. And again, um, assuming that, remember Veronica, she sought men who were aggressive, men who were forceful, men who were would put themselves out there faster. And sometimes guys are not like that. My husband was not like that at all. Yeah. I had to wait for him to make a move because he moved slower than me. Yeah. But, but once he did, once he did, he was sure of what he wanted. And that's what's important. And that's why I wanted to communicate that relationship between Grayson and his daughter, because it reminded me of my husband's relationship with his daughters and what he would do. And many times I would ask in this particular case, what would you do? 
Mm-hmm. And so that's how I would respond in the book. And the, the way that you end this book sets up perfectly for our conversation for next week, Dr. Bellman, because we see Veronica start off as the student yep. uh, in, in The Catch No One Wants. And by the end of the book, she's the teacher. And that sets up perfectly what we'll be discussing next week with the second book in the series, The Wrong Kid. See, I want me to line those up here. So <laughs> so that's what we're going to do. Uh, Angela says, you are so true. And I prayed and asked God to send me a husband. Hello to you, Melissa. Good to be able to see you on the Facebook side as well. Uh, glad you could join us as well. So Dr. Bama, a great conversation. Again, everyone, the first book in the series is The Catch No One Wants. All three are out now. You can be able to get the catch no one wants. You can get the wrong catch. And the newest book that's already an Amazon bestseller, and that is The Wrong Catch, She'll Tear Down the House. You can get all three of these, the Kindle editions, for only 99 cents, or you can get the paperbacks like I have here. I got mine through Amazon. You all can do that as well. Dr. Bama, looking forward to next week. Sherry, hello to you. Sherry Marie is joining us uh, as well. Uh, glad to be able to see you. Uh, Dr. Velma, looking forward to next week's conversation with The Wrong Catch. How can our viewers uh, stay connected with you, though? Yeah, you can stay connected with me on all the social media platforms. It's Dr. Velma, Dr. Velma Bagby, or subscribe to my email. Uh, connect with me on my website at drvelmabagby.com. So I'm looking forward to hearing from you. And I would love to talk with you more, Angela. So reach out. All right. There you go. Glad you all can do. Oh, uh, Sherry asked, uh, um, is it on Audible? I don't even know the answer to that. Is it on Audible? I'm working on them, having conversations now. Oh, there you go. She's having conversations about Audible. So there you go. Conversations with Audible. Sherry, it's coming. <laughs> so so look out for that. Dr. Dr. Velma, great, great conversation as always. And definitely looking forward to continuing it next week. Thank you. All right. Well, we thank your audience for tuning in to another great segment of Cyrus Webb Presents. Until next time, I'm Cyrus Webb saying thank you so much for being with us. We'll talk to you all soon. Take care.